So, I'm going to be a little bit more formal in this lecture than in the last one. Um, remember, in the last lecture, I said we were going to try to, in some sense, formalize or axiomatize a, an essentially mythological situation. So, so, we're now going to try to do a formal definition of a d dimensional quantum <coughs> field theory. So the mythological situation, which is meant to be in the background, is that when we have a d-dimensional manifold, which we think of as a space-time, then we have some notional space in our minds of fields scalar fields or spinner fields or connections, all sorts of things they might be. And we have some action functional, which is also local in the sense I talked about. And associated to this notionally, we want to define some kind of measure. which formally, I said, we write like that, where that's Planck's constant. And from this point on, I'm mostly going to make Planck's constant equal to 1, but I'll put it in there for the last time. This is meant to be a measure on phi. Huh? And we want to, with respect to this integral, perform certain kinds of uh, with respect to this measure, we want to perform certain kinds of integrals. So the kind of thing we want to perform is we uh, let's so we have a point x in M. <coughs> let's write by M x for the jets of fields, whatever they are. <coughs> so that means the <coughs> So things that depend on the values of the fields and their derivatives up to any order at the point. Obviously there's a map then that says any field is meant to have a jet. And we want to be able to evaluate, well, <coughs> we're going to define for any x, we're going to look at the C infinity functions on this. <coughs> and what we're interested in is notionally some multilinear maps <coughs> where these are distinct points of M which notionally are like this <coughs> something which I'll write usually like this That's sometimes with an M one which in principle is meant to be the integral of the space of <coughs> of <coughs> So these are the things which are actually, we actually, this is meant to be encoding the field today. So let's mark that equation. That's what we actually are going to be talking about, and this is mythological background to it, but we like to talk about what properties these functions should have that are motivated by this mythology. So, um, my angle on this is to give the following formal definition, uh, so we can in some sense forget all that for the time being, and we'll say, I'll give the definition, and the, the definition will need lots of comments, which I'll uh, make after I've given it. So this is dimensional. And um, so, okay, so for each uh, compact oriented Romanian. Uh, 
d minus 1 manifold, and we give a topological vector space. So it's not necessarily a Hilbert space, but I'll write it at HN. And for each, for each subordinate of uh, compact way of the manual, and I'll write it sometimes like this, just, just to indicate that, that M it must be some kind of cohortism between a manifold of M0 and a manifold of M1. So that picture, <coughs> you give a continuous trace part, a trace part, a continuous trace part in your map. QM. So that's the end of the data, uh, and we want three properties to hold. So, first of all, concatenation. So all of these will require commentary. <coughs> Which is just that if you string together two subordinates, M and M prime. <coughs> there we go. And the, the property we want is that if we put the two together into a single proportion, then that is a component. <coughs> so the second property I'll just call tensor. <coughs> it says that um, the kind of tensor factor with the space associated to the disjoint union of two manifolds is in some way canonically the tense product. And similarly for cobordisms, if you had a cobordism of this and a cobordism of this, then the cobordisms were tense. So, Uh, I, I wrote down various comments, I don't know. 
So some of these things I'm going to tell you about right away, which I'm going to um, So, uh, let's put various comments. Uh, well, the word, one of the most important, and that's going to be the, the main actual topic of today's lecture, is uh, this M that is in the definition, that's meant to be a space-time. Now, space-time in ordinary physics comes with a Lorentzian metric. Space and time are different. And I've given you an axiom system with Romanian manifolds. So the first point is Lorentzian manifolds versus Romanian. So we're going to be talking about that. Okay. Uh, uh, the second one is um, <coughs> I've made, I assumed everything was compact. I talked about compact manifolds, compact manifolds with down rate and so on. So the compactness is function. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about them very much today at least. I hope I'll come back to them a bit later. Uh, but just in a word, roughly speaking, uh, when one makes these assumptions, what one is saying is that one is only going to be talking about what physicists would call the ultraviolet behavior and not the infrared, infrared behavior. We're going to be talking about what happens at high energies and short distances rather than the opposite. But uh, I'll say more about that, I hope, in a later lecture. Uh, the next thing is more kind of mathematical, technical point. Uh, what kind of topological vector spaces? What kind of topological vector spaces do we allow? Uh, what kind of tensor product? Uh, and perhaps I should say something about trace class operators for those who don't know about such things. So there's a sort of <coughs> functional analysis side. Part of my message is that this, although it seems something you should be careful about, in fact it turns out to be very easy to deal with this point because of the nature of the forms. Uh, so the next thing, in fact I really can't remember what things were um, I'm using improved technology in this time. I bought by football so I can actually see my notes, which I couldn't do in the last time. I have very bad eyes. Uh, so now, the next point is that this, one of the many ways in which this definition is a bit dishonest, you see, is it doesn't really actually make sense. If you were looking carefully, you will see that you can't concatenate two cobordisms, because this is meant to be a smooth manifold with boundary, and this is meant to be a smooth manifold with boundary. The two boundaries are identified, but when you stick them together, you don't have a smooth um, structure unless you choose one. So the way around this is to say that um, <coughs> this thing that we call HM, HM is actually associated associated to a germ of a D minus one manifold inside a D manifold. In other words, one should think of N not quite in the way that I drew it, but as a little neighborhood of a co-dimensional thing inside a D-dimensional manifold. And a germ means a class of neighborhoods of something again, uh, where you identify two neighborhoods if they have a common, uh, you, you identify one neighborhood with another if it's a uh, So obviously if you have an actual neighborhood, then you can concatenate. Well, that again will be important later. Uh, uh, the next thing is I ought to say something about unitarity, so I'm going to postpone that. Because usually we 
I'll come back to that later. And finally, uh, I should mention that there are a lot of possible different structures. So we might consider other classes of manifolds. So I've taken oriented Riemannian manifolds. We might, for instance, want them only to have a conformal structure, or we might want them to have a Riemannian structure together with some additional structure, like an auxiliary vector bundle, or, or possibly with a connection, or something like that. Or we might want them to have even less structure, the extreme case being where we just have smooth manifolds and um, no further structure at all except the orientation. And then people usually talk about a topological field theory, not a currently logical use of words, but that's become traditional. So that's the minimal kind of structure. Uh, well, so that's the, um, that's the setup. Uh, so all of these are things that we're going to come back to. Now, there are a couple of uh, lemmas that one immediately proves from this. Uh, which, which I'm not going to dwell on now. For example, we can consider the space associated to the empty manifold. This is the empty n minus one dimensional manifold. Clearly, that is canonically the complex numbers because obviously, <coughs> if you take any manifold and take it to just join union like that, you have that. So H n has H empty set. <coughs> Again, for all n and that clearly implies that. Uh, one of the other things one traditionally reads of is that if we reverse the orientation of n, so let me put a bar, that means n with reversed orientation, then it's meant to follow from this axiom system that this is canonically the dual vector space to this. Uh, now, you see, in order to say that more precisely, I have to say several other things uh, about the nature of the topological vector spaces and so on. So this is something which just bear in mind for the time being. We'll come back to it later. Uh, <coughs> finally, one of the other traditional things that we uh, <coughs> usually read off is that when you have a cobordism from something to itself, so that, so that we have the same n as both n's, then we have un and then it should follow from these axioms, follows from these axioms that the trace of this is just u m hat. Um, m hat. That's the thing you get from this by making its mapping for us. You identify the two ends by the given identification and you get something that more or less sticks over the circle. That's the mapping for us, let's say. Uh, and what does this mean? Well, you see, this is a map that's a manifold without boundary. So this would be a map from the complex numbers to the complex numbers. And think of maps from the complex numbers to complex numbers as complex numbers and trace. And I said these were trace class operators, so it's meant to have a trace. Is the uh, HN locally complex? Uh, yes, but I'm going to uh, definitely yeah. Absolutely, yes. But uh, so I, I'm going to yeah, so I, I'm going to come back to the topological vector space aspect, but not quite this at the moment. Um, well, so. Uh, one of the things um, uh, so you might think that this is in some way rather little information. So you might think it's too little, uh, and that it doesn't look in the least like what we thought a field theory ought to be. So how do we get the maps which I call star up there? You see, supposing we have an M, 
and we put some points. Then how do we get some data? Such is what I want. Well, first of all, I have to tell you what the phases OX are. Well, <coughs> essentially, OX is just going to be the space H associated with the boundary of U, where U is some little neighborhood, open neighborhood of the point. So it's a little distant like, thing like that. Imagine it's very, very small. And then take its neighborhood and take the space associated to that. But of course, these things form an inverse system. And strictly speaking, I am going to take the inverse limit. where x sits in the interior of u. So these things are ordered by <coughs> inclusion. And you see, when you have one neighborhood contained inside another, then the difference between the two is cobordism from the outside one to the inside one. So it will give you a map giving us an inverse system. But don't worry too much about that. Just think of it as being a space associated with the boundary of a little kind of neighborhood. Well, then, you see, we want to get in this situation not like this. But, you see, if we define a manifold by taking out from M the disjoint union of all vertical disks, or strictly speaking, their interiors, so that's the manifold function. You can think of that as being a cobordism from the boundary of the disks to the empty manifold. I'm assuming M is a closed manifold. Um, and you see, the space associated to this is the tensor product then of the space of the said, well, O. I and so U M hat will go to H to the empty set C. So we do output these things. And furthermore, the obvious thing we have incorporated is the thing which I told you in the first lecture was the main thing we want to incorporate. That you can see if now we divide this manifold M into two by a membrane N. So that M is now and supposing X1 to XT in here, XT plus 1 to XT plus Q, Q plus 2 is K in there. Then you see um, We can we know that um, we can uh, write this cobordism as the composite of two cobordisms So we 
it's still a very weak statement and we need to say a lot more. Well, um, so I, in this lecture I mainly want to talk about this question of so-called weak rotation, the relation between the Mannion and Lorentzian manifolds. But I'll just say one thing, other thing before coming to that, namely, uh, let's just consider the one-dimensional case of Uh, H 
to be the L2 functions on some compact manifold M. Uh, sorry, so this M is not, let me write it as P. This is some auxiliary from no, nothing to do with the space time. The space time is one dimensional in this. Imagine this is this, and imagine the semi group is the usual e to the minus, where this is the Laplace operator, P. So this is the heat semi group. Uh, T is time. This is the case where the system we're studying is a free particle moving in the Riemannian manifold P. This is the typical Hilbert space of states. This, this is, so we're looking at the heat flow. So the information is completely contained in the spectrum of the uh, so it's a classical system. Of course, the classical phase space would be the cotangent bundle of P. And this is a quantization in terms of that language. Uh, and uh, the information we have gathered here is no more or less than simply the spectrum then of the Hamiltonian. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the famous uh, discussion of Mark Katz about hearing the shape of a drum. The famous problem, of course, how much you can determine about a Romanian manifold when you know the spectrum of the Laplace operator. Uh, you can certainly determine the dimension of the manifold, you can determine its volume, you can determine lots of things, but you don't determine it completely. So you think of this one-dimensional uh, example of a quantum field theory as like, so this was the point of view I was trying to push in my first lecture, as something analogous to a non-commutative space. And if you had just a one-dimensional, this is just a quantum system, it's something like a non-commutative manifold. Now, one of the themes of this lecture, apart from quantum field theory itself, is things motivated by string theory. When we discuss two-dimensional quantum field theories and try to say that while a one-dimensional theory is a very crude approximation to a manifold, a two-dimensional theory is a considerably has considerably more claim to be considered as some kind of generalized manifold. I'll say one more thing there. Uh, those of you who study sort of con traditional non-commutative geometry will know that he, his concept of a non-commutative space is often expressed as a so-called spectral triple, which is not only do we have this information, but we have a mod 2 gradient and a little bit more, so that what we are recording is really not just the Laplace operator, but the Dirac operator. Uh, a little bit later on, I'll talk about that, and that corresponds to what's called a supersymmetric one-dimensional theory. And it's supersymmetric two-dimensional theories that re really we should think of as the things entitled to be called generalized manifolds, generalized Riemannian manifolds. But uh, that, that's uh, not the moment. Now I want to change ground and talk about the relation between Minkowski and, and uh, Romanian manifolds. And that I'm afraid for I have found here. Uh, so, so this question is concerned with how one encodes the positivity of energy uh, in physics in quantum theory. If you uh, think of the most elementary treatments of basic quantum theory, uh, so this is not part of my picture, but just part of traditional quantum theory, we traditionally have a Hilbert space of states, and the time evolution is given by, I'm going to suppress Planck's constant from now on, is given by some operator like this, this is evolution of space the time t, where this is some self-adjoint operator, the Hamiltonian. Uh, now, one of the basic things that any properties, any system ought to have is that energy is positive. This Hamiltonian is meant to be the observable of the system. It's a self-adjoint operator on H. 
and to be a so-called observable, it's meant to correspond to the energy of the system. And that ought to be positive. So we want H to be a positive self-return operator. That's meant to be equivalent to saying energy is positive. Now, a good way to encode that statement, this is meant to be a unitary operator, of course, because in time condition. Uh, so a good way of encoding this is to say that the function t to e to the i h t, which is a unitary semigroup as it's written up, this is the boundary value. Thank you. 
where C is the positive black stone. So in the Minkowski space, we have time and space, and we have the black cone, <coughs> the vectors which, in a suitable frame of reference, go forward in time. And the interior of this is meant to be C, the positive black cone. And if the imaginary part of this vector, so this is a complex and open set in C4, and if psi is in that, we have some contraction operator in the semigroup. Well, so that's the so that's the positivity of energy in old sort of <coughs> beginning quantum mechanics. Now we want to uh, generalize that to the framework that I'm, I'm working in. So we now want to say how we expect to do that. Now, in the traditional treatment of quantum field theory, you see because what you did here was you started with Minkowski space and you looked at this domain inside its complexification. It, traditionally, people often think of those functions that we have, which were meant to contain all the information, those things we had right at the beginning. And we think of moving these things out of the original space-time manifold into some complexification. In other words, we try to let the points x, which start off in m, go into some domain in some complexification of them. Well, that's not a very good point of view, as far as I'm concerned, in that normally a smooth manifold doesn't have any complexification. Uh, maybe that's not so serious. You can consider ones which at least look, to some extent, could sit inside a complexification. But it's certainly better, if you're thinking of the path integral picture, not to think in terms of uh, that, but to think of it in terms of a different way. Remember our mythological picture where we have a space of fields and functions. And we should think of this as being a Riemannian manifold, so it's equipped with the Riemannian metric G. And we should think of the action to a field is something which we calculate using the Romanian structure. So instead of talking of changing the points of M, we want to keep the manifold of M fixed. And we want, what we want to change is its Romanian structure. So what we want to do is we want to define a domain of complex metrics. on M. M. M is just as before. So I'll call it uh, with certain properties. In other words, when we were in that situation which was associated to a time displacement of t, the thing that we want to change is not, we don't want to move this point off the line into the complex plane, but we want to change the metric so that t is allowed, t is the length, and we want to make that be a complex number. So a complex metric, g, will be a cross-section of uh, the symmetric square of the cotangent space at each point, but we'll complexify. So if you chose them in local coordinates, it's given by a symmetric d by d matrix with complex entries instead of real entries. And this domain is going to be defined locally. So we're going to pick a domain. So this good domain is going to be, it's just sections of some local metrics. In other words, we're just going to put a local condition on this domain. Like, 
a huge infinite dimensional space of metrics. Now, uh, it's going to be a complex manifold. It's going to be it's going to be an open subset of uh, this whole space. It'll be all complex metrics. So it's going to be a complex domain. It's going to have the real Riemannian metrics as a real slice, and it's going to have the Lorentzian metric sitting on the boundary. So again, what's going to be called the Shirov boundary. In other words, by complexifying, I've doubled the dimension, the real dimension of the space of metrics. We're going to have these boundary things uh, here. Well, let's explain it point by point, first of all. I mean, you might think, uh, you see, <coughs> remember, in some sense, we're trying to look at some path interval over all fields, which, remember, was this is an oscillatory interval. It would have a better chance of existing if instead of being oscillatory, it was something more like Gaussian. So uh, we know uh, if we have an integral just in finite dimensions, half x transpose a x dx, but that's a, a matrix. <coughs> well, that's a symmetric real matrix. Then we know we can make this is conditionally convergent integral in finite dimensions. If we make the imaginary part of that positive definite, going to the so-called Ziegler domain, this will become like an ordinary Gaussian integral and it will really exist. So the first thing you might expect us to do is to say, well, let's just simply take the metrics such that the imaginary part, or, well, I we'll work from the real to the complex, such that the real part of the metric was positive definite. So that's on the right track, but it's not quite right. So let me tell you what the real condition is. You see, let's think of an example. Uh, if you think of a standard scalar field, uh, then you know the actions of a scalar field on the manifold is given in some traditional notation by something like this. I'll, I'll write it in very old fashioned notation. And maybe with the mass term, if you want. Uh, and then we have to put, however, the determinant of g to the minus half dx1 dxb. Uh, it's very important that you put this in. So the thing that we want to be positive is not the metric itself, but the metric that this thing is. So we want the thing that we'd like to be a matrix. I'm sorry, if I'm doing it that way, it should be plus mark. G is zero. So this is G inverse. <coughs> the, the real part of that we'd like to be positive. <coughs> so for instance, in dimension two, that only depends on the conformal structure because the if you multiply G by a scalar the two factors would cancel. So that would be only conditional on conformal structure in two dimensions. Well, it turns out that the right way to think is in terms of the Hodge star operator, which the metric defines. At each point, if we have a metric given complex, we will get something that takes three forms, the D minus three forms, Uh, these all complexify. Uh, and this is the thing that we want to put a condition on. Because we want to be able to say not just that this metric will be good for scalar fields, but it will be good for the essential term in all kinds of field theory we might 
be wanting to think about. For instance, we might want to be doing young girls' gauge theory, where here you find that you're replaced by a collection form, and we have some other experiment. And the thing we want is that this star has the property such that alpha star alpha, we take alpha, alpha is an element of this. So that's in the top exterior tile, which is one dimensional. We want that to have positive. You also see that on the boundary of the domain, you have things which have only one negative dimension. You see, if you make just one of the lambdas be minus one, then its argument is pi, and you've got to the boundary already. So you suddenly can't get two things having having a negative or real negative lambda. So this is a, a very nice domain and it, um, it has on its boundary, it's called the Shelob boundary, these Lorentzian metrics. Now well, there's a long history of this and in two dimensions this had already been much studied, in fact independently by both me and Conservatives in 1986 when I think he was in primary school and we really didn't interact with each other at all. <laughs> well, we uh, well, got very late in this section. I'm afraid I'm going to have to put a little bit of this into the next section because it is rather important for the sequel. Um, so let's consider the case of you. Uh, gosh. Uh, so let, let, let's consider the case of you equal to. So supposing we have a two, so we're looking at surfaces. If we have a two-dimensional tangent space with a complex value of quadratic form on it, non-degenerate, that's determined by giving its two null directions. So the, up, up to a scalar, the form is determined by, if you look at the projective space made from the tangent space, uh, from the complexified tangent space, there'll be two null directions in it two complex directions in which the quadratic form vanishes. Now this condition is exactly equivalent to saying one of these two directions is in each half plane. So this is the real projective line, which is the projective space of the real tangent space, and this is the complex projective line coming from the complex tangent space. And this condition says that these two points are in opposite. Uh, our frames. Uh, and the, on the boundary, uh, so, so the real ones, the ones that are real value of quadratic forms, are where these two points are complex conjugate, which is basically the obvious complex conjugation. And the uh, boundary, the Minkowski ones, are when these two points both come to the boundary, and then you will have two real null directions. So they will be the two light directions that you have on a surface with an impulsive metric. To each point we have two light directions going. Except that there's a degenerate case where these two points come together. That will be when the two light directions coincide. Um, now, uh, I think I'll just... Um, I'm going to have to come back to this next time anyway. But um, I want to uh, explain. I, I think it would be better if I stop at this point and I'm going you to the time when everyone has to be shot. And I'll, I'll start this again in the next lecture. I'm sorry, I've got behind my issue. So I'll stop now.